Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we are talking with Debbie Alexander of the Phillips Programs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So some people may or may not be familiar with this organization because it is a 50-year-old organization that has very interesting roots in serving the needs of children who have special needs, going all the way back to 1967. Fill us in a little bit on the story of Phillips. I'd love to. Um, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, as you said. Uh, we were founded by Dr. Lakin Phillips uh, prior to the passage of the IDA. He had four clients who could not go to school. They were very severe on the what we now call the autism spectrum. And so he bought a little house in McLean and started teaching these four kids. Um, what we've evolved in today is we are what's called a non-public. We serve um, children from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and we're kind of a continuum of the public education school system. Youth are referred to us through their IEP process. And um, so I'll just say that's the individualized education program. Correct. My son had an IEP, so I know about that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's really important because the IEP, as you know, is evaluated on an annual basis. Um, one of the beautiful things about Phillips is we don't have a program that children come and fit into. We literally create a program around each child. So our population is a little difficult to describe because it's so varied. But what's common among all of our students is they've experienced trauma. And what does that mean? The trauma can look a, a lot of different ways. For some children who um, are on the autism spectrum and are nonverbal, that trauma can be the frustration of not being able to communicate effectively with anybody. Imagine going through your day and experiencing different things and not being able to communicate what you need. Right. It's very frustrating. So the students have behaviors so that they can't really be served effectively in their referring um, school. Uh, the goal is not for students to come to Phillips in kindergarten and stay until they graduate. We work very hard to return them to the referring jurisdiction if we can. So you provide also then a behavioral therapy toward that end. Right. So Phillips programs um, is comprised of four special education day schools. We have a school in Annandale, that's our oldest campus and our headquarters a uh, school in Fairfax, a building program out in Leesburg, and another campus in Laurel, Maryland. Um, in addition to, so at the school, we have small classrooms. There's nine students in every class. There's a lead teacher and an assistant teacher. And then we have behaviorists. We have um, therapists. We have speech therapists, occupational therapists, reading specialists. Um, uh, the kids just get an incredible array of support services during the school day. In addition to the special education day schools, we have another program called Family Partners. Family Partners doesn't just serve the students enrolled in Phillips, we serve the broad community in Virginia. The goal of Family Partners is to keep the family intact. If you have a child with the kinds of behaviors that lead to a referral to Phillips. Sometimes parents give up their parental rights um, or for other reasons there's a danger of the child being removed from the home. So we provide 24-hour crisis counseling and we have some great parenting classes that are offered to the broad public, teaching calming techniques um, and uh, it's really a wonderful program. You know, I heard on NPR recently an interview with a mom who, in, who had adopted a premature infant who'd been mm -hmm. left behind and the huge challenges she had in trying to get him services. Um, he had struggled with a lot of behavioral and mental health issues mm -hmm. right up until he was a teenager. And so I would never have even known what you meant to by surrendering parental rights if I had not heard this interview and her choice about whether or not to get him care, she would have to do that. I think this is in California, maybe. Right, it's much more common than people realize. And so that's, imagine the trauma to that child has experienced exactly. having to leave their family. Uh, and I, not un even understand why. But one of the things the mom pointed out, she goes, when your child has mental health behavioral issues, she goes, this is a non-casserole -cas illness. 
You know, she goes, if your child had cancer, everybody would show up at your house with a casserole. Right. When your child has mental health issues or behavioral issues, no one comes. They run away. They avoid you. That's exactly right. I'm so glad you used the medical analogy because that's how Piper Phillips Caswell, our CEO, likes to describe Phillips. If you have a cold and you go to your primary care physician, he'll care for you. But if you have cancer, something that's outside of his ability to serve you, then he'll refer you to a specialist like an oncologist. Well, that's what Phillips is. We're a specialist designed to address those mental health needs that um, our clients need. And this is something, and again, there's still a stigma around this. As much as I think the public is getting better informed, I think we're doing a better job at identifying those who need mental health services and supporting them in a way that makes sense. And that's everything from education to supported housing. You know, the Diversion First, First program here in Fairfax County trying to keep people with mental health challenges out of jails. And let's talk about the fact that, you know, for adolescents more than anything else, you know, people fear for their teenage children, especially their teenage sons, interacting with law enforcement or in some way where they might be put in harm's way. We had a gala um, last weekend and we honored Sharon Bulova and we are so excited about what Fairfax County is doing with Diversion First. As she says, and Sheriff Kincaid, mental illness is not a crime and it shouldn't be treated as such. So we're really, really grateful to have our headquarters in Fairfax County where there's that policy choice to really destigmatize mental illness. It's, illness, it's really wonderful. Um, another thing that we focus on in addition to the education and the therapy is preparing our youth for the world of work. Now students can be in our program up to the age of 22 if they're on a certificate program or others graduate at 18, but that doesn't mean that they're going to go on to um, community college or a four-year institution. So we have this wonderful program that's been going on for decades called Education for Employment. At age 14, the students are assigned a job coach and we partner with about 40 to 50 different businesses um, on any given year. And the students um, go to work during uh, the school day and they're not just learning skills, they're being exposed to different kinds of jobs, but they're also developing that, those soft skills that are essential for success. They're learning to show up on time. They're learning to speak properly, to follow directions. Um, to be on a team, to, to take be, feedback. Exactly, all those things that um, make you a successful employee. And we make it very easy for the businesses that partner with us. So we're not just putting kids in a bus and dropping them off at your doorstep. They come with their job coach and, um, and it's a supported situation. Um, and we're very grateful to the businesses that are willing to bring our students into their stores and, and shops and give them a chance. And many of our students have gone on to work for some of the businesses. Um, I know one young man is working at Track Auto and he started out sweeping the floors basically, stocking things in the back, but the staff there just wrapped their arms around him and encouraged him to speak with customers and um, start selling. So that's, that's kind of exciting. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, it is about teaching skills, but then it's putting these young people in the right environment that's accepting and inclusive and supportive. And you know, how do you find your partners? And I'm assuming you would like to scale that. Absolutely. Another thing that we're doing is uh, two years ago, we created a new program called the Career Partners Program, and we really want to scale up what we're doing in the career and technical education space. So at our Laurel campus, we um, raised money and we put in a commercial kitchen and a vertical farm. At our Annandale campus, we have a 3D design and print program, and that's done in partnership with another nonprofit called YouthQuest Foundation. And then we have this fabulous building trades program. So in Fairfax, our students are building homes. Uh, we sold our first house last year. It sold for $585,000. Now you can build a house in a month, but it took us four years to build this house. Because you're training them in the trades, <laughs> right? Exactly, it's not about building and selling the house. It's all those soft skills that I talked about. 
It's a beautiful home over by um, Thomas Jefferson High School, and now we're building our second house. And it's just incredible to see the kids and the pride sure. that they gain. Um, I remember we had an open house for the first house, and this young man whose family had been in and out of homelessness was talking to visitors, and he just kind of stood up really ta tall, and he was so proud, and he said, you know, I like to think about the child that's gonna grow up in this house that I built. Wow. Brought tears to my eyes. Right, it yeah. shows such a pro projection of empathy and impact and understanding how you've done something for someone else, which is remarkable for a young person to understand the long-term impact of something they've done. Exactly, it's very hands-on. The other thing that I love about visiting the work site is when they have break time, they play chess, which I think is really cool. No, no kidding, all three of my kids play chess. I do not play chess. <laughs> I don't play chess, but my kids do. But the, the Career Partners Program we're really excited about, and we have a very exciting long-term vision for that program. What we'd like to do is take lines of business that we can expand beyond the time of a child's graduation. Um, so we've been following the wealth building work that the Community Foundation of Northern Virginia is doing, and uh, we hope to create four um, employee-owned business entities. So when kids graduate at 22, they can apply for supported apprenticeships. Because what do we do in today's world? We give kids all these great supports, coaching, counseling, What's so magic about the age 22? Nothing. Nothing. Those kids are not ready to be sent out into the world of work on their own. So we're really working hard at developing something with that longer term vision. And we're looking for companies in the area that share our passion for helping youth develop the skills and find opportunities where they can earn a livable wage. That's the key because it's expensive in this area and that's the other problem is that even even kids coming out of college can't find places where they can afford to live. But imagine that you're in a trade and you want to live anywhere remotely close to where you're working. This is going to be an economic struggle, I think, for many. And um, when we come back from our break, I want to talk more about how we can support these young people living independently. So please join us after the break. I'm talking with Debbie Alexander. She is with the Phillips Programs, which has been in our area since 1967. And this is the information that you'll want to know. <laughs> Maria, so how's work? It was fourth period biology. Our students just weren't getting how easily viruses spread. So Ms. Bell and I had them role play a zombie virus outbreak. By the time they had all learned the lesson, all the living were dead. Hey, how's your job going? That big sales meeting I planned? Next year, I might get to go. <clears throat> cool. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today I'm talking with Debbie Alexander of the Phillips Programs. I am so fascinated by everything you have had to say today about the work Phillips is doing. Um, tell us a little bit about the average age at which students are accessing these services that you provide. Delighted to. The average age currently is about 16 which is unfortunate. It would really benefit the students if they were referred to schools like Phillips a little bit earlier, because the earlier the intervention, the less time the child has experienced the frustration of not being successful in a more traditional setting. So 
um, that can be an issue. Yeah, so that's you know that's one thing with the IEP. I think maybe awareness the, of the fact that you that there are services available. I don't I know I don't know of the of our viewers right now how many have ever heard of Phillips program whose child maybe has an IEP and they are not aware that there might be an alternative to just struggling through what they have? Access to information about resources seems to be a constant issue for parents and something that we're about to launch is a new website that will have a resource directory because not only are we about um, educating students and providing services but also advocacy for the issues that face the youth that we serve and providing information to parents whether they're going to be a parent at Phillips or another institution because it's complicated. You know, the students that come to us um, are one size fits all, and there are a lot of different resources like Phillips, but for some reason, um, awareness could be better. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that we're around, and we've been here for 50 years. I wouldn't have known about you except that I sat next to Piper Phillips at a luncheon two years ago at Christmas time. We have a mutual friend, Karen Garvin, and mm -hmm. I, that's how I knew about Phillips. And then when mm -hmm. I ran into you at this conference, I'm like, Phillips, okay, we need to like raise awareness of what you're doing. And I think, you know, I worked on the autism insurance reform back in 2011 here in Virginia, trying to get behavioral therapy and intervention covered by medical insurance companies as a medical service and you know we continue to struggle with that as far as getting them to crush the cap and strip away this age 10 um, limit because autism doesn't end at 10. No. Right and so what I'm hearing from from you is the fact that there are things that could be done for younger kids it's a matter of do parents know what's available and how would they access the Phillips program if no one's told them that this might be the right alternative for their child. Well, parents should feel free to visit our website and uh, our caller number 703-941-8810 um, <clears throat> and come for a tour. Um, the staff at Phillips are very happy to meet with parents, answer their questions. Um, and let them know more about the resources in our area. And I think the more parents, too, understand what their children's options are, because a lot of children with special needs, it's kind of like what will happen. You know, if they're not going to go to community college or they're not going to go to college, what is going to happen? How will they earn a living, live independently, and be integrated into a larger community? And so if we start tackling that at 12 or 14, as opposed to tackling that at 16, I'm going to guess that the outcomes might be exponentially better. Or six or seven. Or six or seven, <laughs> for that matter. But basically, you know, developing the skills that are going to make them suited to certain trades. Um, culinary arts is something you mentioned that you've added. And there's a culinary arts program at the Davis Center. And Cameron Graham went there, is a graduate of that culinary arts program. And so Cameron's Coffee and Chocolates down at Fairfax Circle was created specifically to employ young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that's, and that's how I connect the dots between teaching young people a skill, understanding that they can do the job, and in her case, her parents started this business not just for her sake, but for a lot of other young people as well. And I think as far as scaling your, your partnerships, this is what you're also looking for too, is businesses and, and companies and industries that are gonna welcome your students with open arms. Exactly, I know Cameron's Chocolates well, it's phenomenal. Um, we had our gala uh, last weekend and a young man, Devante, came and spoke. Last year, he was also a speaker at the gala. He was a senior and he really had not thought about going on to school. Well, he was in our first cohort in the vertical farm and it just inspired him. And he decided based on his success working with the microgreens that he wanted to apply to college. Well, he was accepted. And this year he came back as someone who's finishing his first year of school and doing well to address the gala again and share how that inspiration changed his life, and not only did he ex get accepted to college, but he's doing well. And that's really exciting, because it's looking at lines of work that um, open the youth up to the things that they can do, focus on what their abilities are. 
in 3D design and print, a lot of the students um, who are in that class happen to be on the autism spectrum because they're happy doing things that are repetitive. And we partnered, I think I mentioned, with YouthQuest Foundation, which is a wonderful organization um, here in the area. And um, it's a two-year-old partnership, and we're really looking to expand that greatly. And we're looking for partners who might want to underwrite that expansion. Um, but our first cohort, when they graduated getting their certificates, um, the teacher from YouthQuest said that our kids produced some of the most sophisticated work he had seen. And one of the things about that curriculum that's really terrific is it's infused with the idea that failure doesn't matter. Right. And that's a big thing for our students to understand that they can fail and they will fail, um, but they learn how to work around it, work through it until they produce something that works. We have um, two annual events that happen every year and our first annual 5K is coming up in May and the 3D design and print students created, printed on their printers, the first, second, and third place medals. Which oh, wow. we're really so cool. excited. Isn't that neat? So anytime we do something, we look at a way to infuse the work of our students. You know, I think that's amazing. And I know that all organizations are constantly looking for collaborations and partnerships and funding because that's just the nature of the beast. So you have a gala every April. Mm -hmm. Now you're starting to do your race. This will be, I guess, your first race. Our first um, race um, is uh, this May and it's part of our 50th anniversary celebration. Um, next year it'll be in October, but it's a lot of fun. It was really developed um, as something to celebrate the 50th. We're encouraging our families to attend and it's to raise money for yet another program, our Food for Thought program. Fantastic. Um, we serve every student a nutritious breakfast um, and then we serve our free and reduced fee lunch students uh, lunch. Um, because we serve everyone a nutritious breakfast, um, we need to raise, in addition to the funds that we get for the free and reduced lunch, um, about $80,000 a year. So um, the proceeds from the 5K will go to our Food for Thought program. I think that's fantastic. You know, if I could wave a magic wand, one of my wishes would be for all schools, public, private, or otherwise, is that students get nutritious meals included as part of their education. I don't, you know, there are it's other countries. Essential. Well, other countries do that. I won't po keep pointing to like Norway and <laughs> Finland and all of those. But you know, the uh, whole concept that child would come to school and they would be served a nutritious breakfast and, and lunch, possibly even prepared on site. I think in Japan, the students help to prepare the food, serve the food, and clean up afterwards. I mean, it's a cultural thing. That's not our culture. But I'm just saying that we could be a little, we could have a little more imagination about how we wrap nutrition into our education process. I totally agree. Um, the students who work in the vertical farm harvest the microgreens and vegetables, walk across the hall, and then make soups, salsas, panini, See, this is, this pastas. is it. This is exactly what I mean. And a lot of our students come from areas that are food deserts. So that's another thing. Our um, vertical farm and commercial kitchen classes are infused with nutrition, um, counseling, wellness. Uh, some of those kids had never really seen greens right, prior to working. I know, and, and wellness, nutrition is wellness. Like what we eat is what impacts our health. And unfortunately, culturally, we've just gotten into shelf-stable foods, canned foods, fast foods, you know, and, and it's impacting the health of our entire population, but certainly our children have suffered a lot from being denied better nutrition. Absolutely. And there's nothing so wonderful than to grow something with your own hands, prepare it in a meal, and enjoy it. It just well, it's like the your your building trades program to build a house and know that you know every time you drive drive by it, you're like, I made that, I made that because there's a sense that you did something, you made something, and that you did it yourself. Uh, you know, the sense of accomplishment that comes from those things is just goes beyond anything that is about education or anything else. It's just setting it all up so that you put the student in the right place to have the skills to go forth and be successful. That's it, and the other thing that, that Phillips provides both students and families, I hear it over and over again, our favorite word is hope. You hear it over and over. Parents say, 
the first day that their child came to Phillips, they were waiting for the phone call for their child to be called and sent home, and that call doesn't come. Um, and then we have all these programs, and we really focus on what the child can do. We're non-judgmental, always, always focusing on what they can do, and that's a pretty incredible thing. The staff at Phillips is so incredible. I mean, people have been there for decades, and um, everyone is just truly committed to that, the well-being of that child. And there's no substitute for that. Honestly, there is not. And, and my hat is off to the people who have decided that this is their mission, and they know they can make the difference in the life of a child. Whose family has had a tough time of it? I want to share a story that's Piper's favorite story. Uh, she always goes out for bus dismissal to see the kids off. And this young man came walking up and he said, I used to go to school here. May I go inside and say hi to the teachers? And she said, well, everyone's coming out now. And he said, okay. So people started coming out and a few teachers glanced over and had that look of recognition. And then this one teacher came out and just looked at him. And he looked at her and then they just hug. And he started to sob, just completely broke down sobbing. And when he finally gathered himself together, he said, they never gave up on me. Wow. And that really sums up Phillips. We don't give up on our students. We are there for them and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Debbie. And I hope all of our viewers better understand what the Phillips programs have to offer. They offer hope. They offer training. They offer the skills necessary for our children to be successful. And this is what you need to know.